Okay. Uh, well, um, hello. Uh, my name is Mina. I'm a researcher at Great Team. And today we have the dialogue on immigration and education, how to distinguish problems from challenges. So our speakers today are two great experts, Miguel Angeles Somba and Xenia Heldren. Uh, Miguel Angeles Somba is a doctor in pedagogy from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And he's an associate professor in the Department of Applied Pedagogy and director of the Chair on Community Education at Autonomous University of Barcelona. He also leads the research group on diversity and inclusion in complex societies. He has also developed an intense political and social activity, such as the direction of the UNESCO Center of Catalonia, the direction of the Sirius Network of the European Commission on Education and Immigration Policies, and he was the Commissioner of Education of the Barcelona City Council. And Xenia Helgren is a Doctor of Sociology and Senior Researcher at GRIP Team. Currently, she's a Maria Marie Curie Researcher Fellow, and her main research areas involve inclusion and exclusion, precarity and agency of immigrants and racialized groups in European societies, with a particular focus on discrimination. She has engaged with inequalities in the education system um, as leader of two EU-funded research projects, one of them being Roma Inclusion in Education, Fostering Constructive Attitudes and Good Practices in the Barcelona area, and the other one uh, being REPCA, the role of the ethnic majority in integration processes, attitudes and practices towards immigrants in the Catalan institutions. Um, so we can um, start with the presentations uh, with Mi uh, Miguel's uh, work. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mina. Uh, thanks, Zinia, for sharing this round table. And thank you as well to Ricard Zapata, dear colleague and, and friend, for this kind invitation to be here with you among us. Uh, as Mina was already announcing, I'd like to start my presentation by introducing the, 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 the key framework where I have been working in the field of research on education and migration. And this, sorry, can you do it to And this framework refers, thank you, to uh, a network that you can easily find on the website, on the web, which is uh, the Sidious network. This is a network that was established initially in Barcelona, by the way, at the beginning of 2012. And this network was an initiative by the Commission, by the European Commission, in order to promote an interdisciplinary uh, task force where different kind of stakeholders, I mean decision makers, policy makers, policy implementers, uh, civil society leaders, uh, professionals, trade unions, ministries of education come together in the same place and discuss, analyze and find out conclusions in order to explore which are the improvements we may introduce in European education systems concerning education and migration. Just have a look at it and uh, you will see what is uh, the frame where I come from and the research I've been producing for years in recent times. Uh, let me just point out that this network uh, aims to, to become a kind of reference for the EU in terms of education and migration. We've got a, a vision our vision is that universal right to education is fully implemented to all students, to, to everyone, irrespective their origin or other uh, individual features. And uh, the mission is to create opportunities for meeting, for gathering, for working together among all these stakeholders I already mentioned before. So we particularly strive for the universal right to education 
for all without any kind of discrimination, to increase the high quality of public education services, to promote better education, better school integration, to advocate for the reduction of segregation and early school living, two of the major goals for a European policy based on education, and finally, the development of curricula which integrate issues concerning cultural diversity, but also linguistic and religious ones. The objectives that we follow is to feed these uh, best evidences and practices. That is why we do research in uh, an international atmosphere. We also analyze and co-create knowledge with policymakers. So this is not only a network restricted to people that are working in the field of knowledge, but also in the field of practice, no matter the practices, political or uh, professional, together with students, families, and others. And uh, we aim to identify which are the best, the good practices uh, and the innovations that facilitate this kind of improvement that I was saying. So this is a brief, short presentation that you may enlarge if you like, uh, if you just simply click on the, on the website and you will see all what we do, our research, uh, our current researchers and all our publications concerning the issue that we are discussing this evening. Thank you. Okay, th thank you very much, uh, Mina. Thank you, Ricard and Miguel, also for, for sharing this uh, occasion to talk about something that I believe is an absolutely fundamental issue when we talk about uh, equality of opportunities of people of migrant and minority origin, no? which is the education area. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the two projects that Mina mentioned, which is um, the main work that I have done in this field. The first project was called the Roma Inclusion in Education, Fostering Constructive Attitudes and Good Practices in the Barcelona area. And this was a collaboration between uh, ourselves here at Gritim and the two Roma associations called Fundació Privada Periclosa and Roma Neciclovne, and also with collaboration of the Barcelona City Council's Office of Non-Discrimination. And the aim of this project, which was uh, partly research-oriented and partly implementation-oriented, was to improve the communication and the relations between schools and Roma families in four neighborhoods in the uh, Barcelona metropolitan area that are all characterized by very high levels of school failure and early abandonment, and also with high, high concentrations of Roma population. And La Mina, San Roque, Bon Pastor and El Guarnal are the names of these uh, neighborhoods. We had a fairly high amount of participants, altogether 231 people, and we worked very intensively with them for 18 months. We both conducted ethnographic, ethnographic field work and also practical activities to encourage more interaction between schools and families. Uh, our main findings after concluding the analysis of this project was that the Roma families, altogether 80 Roma families participated in the project, and without exceptions, they expressed high expectations on the education of the children, in the sense that they were convinced that educational su success was the only opportunity really for their children to have a better life than themselves. This was the words they usually employed to describe you know, their, their preoccupation, they all had quite precarious life situations, and they were worried that their children would not be able to achieve a higher standard of living or greater opportunities than themselves. And they shared the view that education is the only key, really, to, to success in life you know, for their children. 
However, they also experienced difficulties in being able to support their children adequately. And they generally expressed this uh, as being due to the lack of time and resources and the economic and labor related precariousness that they all lived in. All of the families except three mothers and fathers, for example, did not have any stable forms of employment. They generally worked with ambulating sales or sales in informal marketplaces uh, in the informal economy, obviously. And and had uh, high degrees of insecurity, long work hours, unpredictable work hours, and difficulties really to, for example, help the children with homework. And all, also we found that this, the experience of discrimination was very widespread among the mothers and fathers, and they expressed the fear that their children would also have these experiences, and that, for example, it, investing in higher education would not be worth the effort if they would still be affected by discrimination in work life. No, this was a common, common worry that they expressed in the study. Uh, overall, in any case, the, family, the families, what they mostly requested was more support from the schools. And I have in included here a site from a Roma father which was illustrative of, of the view of these families. Um, and he said, I don't know any gitanos, gitanos, the Spanish word for, for Roma, which is really gypsy, right? But this is it's quite different to say gitano in Spanish compared to gypsy in English. It's not as, uh, as negative, as pejorative. They use it themselves, for instance. No? Uh, I don't know any gitanos who don't care about the children's educations, education, but it, it is something else, whether they know how to help them or not. And the schools don't teach us, for instance, what we must do to make it to secondary school. Most parents cannot help their children with this. They have no education themselves. Then, on the other hand, we, in parallel, we conducted a study uh, with the school staff, teachers, and the headmasters of schools, for example, and also support staff as, as uh, social workers and psychologists. And they overall expressed frustration because they perceived that the Roma families were not enough involved or interested in the education of their children. This was the most common concern when asking the school staff, what is the matter? Now, why are the Roma students failing so disproportionately in school. And um, they overall also expressed low expectations on the educational outcomes of Roma pupils, which they justified by this being a fact that the situation was not very encouraging. No? And uh, there were, however, large individual variations between the schools and between teachers in the same school, not the least concerning the causes for school failure. And uh, where some of them tended, for example, to explain the situation by blaming Roma culture, so to speak, and saying that this is the way they are, they don't care about education, what's important for them is to get married early, etc. No? While others would say that this is because of the poverty and the marginalization, etc. But, but still, the general sentiment, regardless of whether you would be more understanding, so to speak, towards the situation or not, was that the overall sentiment was frustration. No? And, this, and the feeling that there's not much we can do because the families do not participate, they are not engaged, and there's only so much we can do in the schools. Uh, so overall, a high degree of family involvement was considered essential for educational success. Uh, for example, one headmaster of a school said, everyone who finished this school and had a strong support at home gets good grades in secondary school. It doesn't happen to a lot of children, but it happens. So here, in short, School success is dependent on family support at home, basically. Uh, then, do I have time to talk about the other project? Or? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, this is my current research project uh, within the framework of my Marie Curie, which uh, includes the education system within a study of three, three institutions in Catalan society, education, the Catalan police force, and the political and public uh, administration of the city of Barcelona. And I conduct document and discourse analysis of, for example, policies and programs, websites and campaigns issued by these institutions, also media articles, and in the case of the schools, also textbooks used in, in primary and secondary school. Uh, I also conduct interviews with actors representing these institutions, as well as, uh, for instance, immigrant associations. And uh, I have uh, not yet concluded the project, so I'm going to talk just about some preliminary findings here uh, that refer to the education system. 
And this, what I have found overall, which I be believe is most relevant in this context, is that the diversity management actually implemented in practice in the schools, the implementation of intercultural ideas in schools, is completely voluntary, and it depends largely on individual school directors. There are no compulsory training programs, for example, no requirements at all in this field, only recommendations. Uh, and this leads to a situation in which there are huge variations between schools in how or if they work with the issue of diversity, right? Or whether, for example, racism is discussed, etc. And I have a, it's a long quote I have here, but I think it's quite uh, illustrative as well of, of the situation. At, uh, this is a high, high person, a person with high position of uh, the Department of Education, who says that it is not that the system is discriminatory. There is much awareness at enseignement and also in many schools, but the reality is, of course, complex many times. I think that we have an excellent education system, but then how interculturalism and diversity is implemented in different schools, it depends on the school boards and the teachers at each center. There are also differences between teachers. It depends on many things, on whether they have been trained in these issues, if they prioritize it, if they have reflected upon it. There are a series of recommendations in line with our interculturalism policy, though these are recommendations, not an imposition. I think that it's important. We cannot force this on people. That was, was her view, that it should be voluntary, right? And the representation in, of diversity in the school system, I would like to underline this, that it is inevitably linked to school failure uh, of success among children of immigrants, not only because we can assume that a greater representation of diversity, for example, in the t content, educational material, but also among the teachers, for example, would inspire and be more um, inspiring for immigrant children and also make them and their families identify with the schools to a greater extent. That is one side of it, but there is also a more concrete link, right? That, that school failure automatically leads to a situation in which there are fewer children of, or youth of immigrant origin that could reach the university and then could uh, potentially become teachers in the future, right? And these are, these are recent data on school failure in Catalonia. We see that among the ethnic majority, uh, this is around 10%. If we look at the, the first generation of immigrants here, we have 17.3%. Uh, I think, yeah, 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 that's right. Yes, and then it's hi actually higher among the second generation. Is that right? Yeah, you think so? It's, it's, those are the numbers they have. Uh, those are very surprising to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And this is what is extreme. What is most serious? I think that it it is not only not better, but actually worse in the second generation. And then, if we look at the Roma students, we have astronomic rates, really. No? More, far more than half of the Roma students do not manage to finish compulsory school at age 16. Uh, so some conclusions from uh, Vakeri Pen and Repcat, these two projects that I uh, just talked about. Uh, and, I, and I have formulated this in addressing Mina's questions. The idea of this uh, debate would be to talk about problems or challenges, right? So I have formulated these conclusions in uh, in terms of two challenges and one problem. So the first challenge here that I have identified was the lacking mutual identification between schools and families. The school staff are, are it's a fact, they are mainly white, middle class, majority culture people uh, who may have, to a greater or lesser extent, which we found very clearly in the Roma project, <coughs> difficulties in identifying with families who live in completely different worlds compared to their own, no? perhaps many times with more urgent matters than the school activities, for instance, making enough money in the marketplace to buy food at the you know. So the idea of, that the schools perceive as, as a lack of interest in education may in practice many times reflect a reality in which the families are overwhelmed with just very basic necessities. No? Uh, on the other hand, also the diverse families, diverse, the minority families, so families of immigrant backgrounds or Roma families, may have difficulties in feeling that the school represents them. That this, there is this mutual perception of living in different worlds many times. No? So uh, what solutions can we imagine here? Just a few could be, for instance, to, to in the teacher training, make it compulsory to talk about applied interculturalism 
also transmitting knowledge about the life conditions among migrant groups and Roma. Right now, there is no such uh, automatic inclusion of interculturalism and diversity in, in the programs for future teachers at universities, for example. Um, one, another one could be more flexibility from the schools, for instance, trying to accommodate the needs of the families of more flexible schedules for school meetings to go a little bit outside of the regular hours for these meetings, which many times, and I know that from my own experience, having children in the school system here, they often want you to show up in the middle of the day at one o'clock, for example, and, and this is of course not compatible with all kinds of situations. No? So what may then be perceived from the school as a lack of interest when you don't show up is that you, you're actually not able to, to attend to those schedules. Right? Uh, also, uh, real implementation of diversity in the school curricula could be one way to increase the sentiment among minority families that the school represents them no? by going a little bit outside of the, the European uh, uh, sphere when including scientists, authors, artists, etc. No? Revise history education to, to a greater extent talk about colonialism, for example, or about the Roma victims of the Holocaust. There is some, some are concrete examples of how this could be done in practice. Uh, the second challenge here uh, was, it was very clear from this first project on Roma inclusion that the families overall requested more support from the schools. And how could this be done? For example, we could, you could suggest that schools would extend and improve support systems, uh, for instance, academic orientation and mentorship programs, which was much uh, requested by the students and also appreciated by the students in the cases that we found where schools actually did apply these kind of methods. And what we found here was that it's not only important that the students have support, because there is this idea that family support is fundamental, but who supports the student is very important, and th that this person actually has know-how, resources, networks, actually can help the student with concrete issues as finding scholarship opportunities, for instance, that is relevant. So family, of course, it's important and it's positive to have your family backing you up and at least not creating obstacles for you in your choice of continuing to study. No? But it's not necessarily enough because if the family cannot help you with many of these practical issues that you need help with, and if nobody else does that, that may be the factor that actually influences on the student not continuing his or her studies. And uh, here is a quote from a young man of Roma origin who now works as a school mediator. Yes, two, two minutes, that's okay, he's finished this, yeah. Uh, and, um, I think that this quote is quite important because he put the finger on what was exactly the issue for, for many of these young people and their families. So. so he says, they always say that the Gitano families do not worry about education. The reality is quite different. Many times the families are required to comply with different criteria, but they are not accompanied. My family has always wanted me to study, always. But I did not make it because my mother wanted to, but because of the support that I got from school. In my work, I meet many parents who want an education for their children, but they do not get the support from the teachers. And so these are the two challenges that I think would be possible to solve, not within current frameworks, if there is enough willingness to do so. No? Uh, but what I define as a problem here that is more difficult to propose a solution for is the question of precariousness that is widespread among many migrant and Roma families and which also affects directly the family school relations and the possibilities for, for educational success. So uh, lacking resources is for example a common impediment for learning. There are many students who don't have a PC at home. There were surprisingly many cases that we found during the Roma project of children who actually attended school hungry or inadequately dressed and uh, the teachers explaining also some, in some cases more or less desperately that they had, they could not focus on actual teaching because they had to attend to basic needs, they had to go and buy sandwiches for children who hadn't had breakfast at home, etc. No? And also that parents are unable to pay for school fees as educational material, which has detrimental effects for children who then cannot follow the education at the same pace. And also that know that they will be unable to pay for post-compulsory education and therefore do not consider it worthwhile to to support education more actively than they do. So what solutions uh, to this problem? That would be basically that more, more resources are necessary. It's a necessary component of poli policies to improve inclusion of diversity in the schools. Uh, but can anything be done right now without additional costs? 
Well, that would be then the support systems, information, mentorship programs, etc. Uh, so the challenges here are what I have defined as prob problems or, or difficulties that are possible to overcome through a change of mind, through training, awareness raising, etc. While the problems, in my view, would be uh, issues where more resources or structural changes are necessary. That's that's it. Okay. Thank you both for your uh, introduction. Um, I wanted to start the dialogue by asking you, um, so what both of you think, how did the arrival of immigrants in the education system impact the educator's perspective of Roma students? Is, did this in any way change their perspective and their view or policies towards diversity? Maybe, maybe I, I, don't know, I, I would ask Miguel if you mm -hmm. have an opinion on that because we, we did not really approach that issue, I have to say, we, about how we did not compare Roma or Im immigrant students. And, and this was not so much an issue in the schools. The most, where, where there was a comparative I, approach on Roma and immigrant students in the schools where we did our study, it was mainly about the resources, right? That there were not enough resources for anyone. So the Roma families perceived that the arrival of immigrants meant more, less resources for them because more competition over, for example, scholarships for school meals or materials. Okay. That was mainly the, the issue related to, to immigrants versus Roma. No? Mm -hmm. That was the, mm. Yeah, I know the. Uh, so how did the arrival of immigrants uh, in the education system impact the educator's perspective of Roma students? Well, uh, I'd like to, uh, I need to refer to one of my latest researches in which we are trying to analyze the, this kind of impact as well as the relationship between uh, culture and gender issues. We are doing a research for the Ministry of Education of Catalonia in those terms. We are acting uh, we are re doing research in four, in four schools in Barcelona area, in metropolitan Barcelona area, and we realize we, we, are not, uh, we haven't finished it yet, but so far, with all the data collected and all the evidences, we realize that uh, both Roma and immigrant uh, populations have uh, these kind of uh, challenges, uh, maybe problems in terms of school achievement, mm -hmm. right? So school achievement is a big issue for both. And uh, the differences start from the point of uh, expectation. Because we realize that for Roma families, expectations towards, uh, with respect to school, are very low. Why that? Because normally the parents of Roma children, of Roma pupils at schools, used to be former Roma pupil students in those schools, in the same schools sometimes. And uh, there are no, there is no tradition, there is no pathway of school achievement of school success for Roma communities. It's very, there are very few cases of school success within the Roma community. One girl in this school, two boys in that school. It's very minority somehow. Mm -hmm. However, the expectation of migrant families with regards to education are very high. For some communities, more than for others. But in general terms, we realize that all of them agree and try to push uh, their, their children to go better at school, to have uh, good marks, to get qualifications, to get diplomas, because they did a migration process in order to improve their, uh, their standards of living and their uh, social positions. So that is why they realize that education is an essential factor to do so. And that is why 
expectations res with respect to education uh, within migrant communities are higher than for Roma population. The second difference is that Roma population tends to be uh, more stigmatized than migrant population. So when you have a look at those uh, schools where we are doing research, we immediately realize that those who are more excluded and suffer more from exclusion and segregation are Roma children, are Roma pupils, not immigrant pupils. Because there is a kind of combination of factors between cultural, social, and economical factors that, emer that, that, that create that kind of situation that this group uh, is seen as an extremely marginalized group. However, migrants are competing to each other in order to leave these positions. When we have a look at the surveys on the citizenship perception of communities, migrant communities, Roma communities, since the 90s, you already know it. Uh, studies from Calvo Buethas and others already stated that Roma communities are the less considered by the whole population. And this is reproduced within the schools. And that is why Roma population have more difficulties for integration than migrant communities. And do you think this was even more accentuated after the arrival of immigrants as the policies for diversity direct, are directed towards immigrants? Actually, I would say that the recent migration uh, plays a role as a mirror. I mean, if this migrant population would not exist, probably Roma population would stay in the same position, would have the same social status, the lowest one. However, the arrival of migration creates a kind of competition in order to leave this latest position. And it's a kind of mirror where we realize the difficulties and uh, the real problems that the Roma population, Roma communities are suffering from. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, this is absolutely true what, what Miguel is saying, but I would like to add that I think that we need also to apply a more diversified view on the category of immigrant, right? Because there are huge differences between different groups of immigrants. So if we pose a very, very diverse category of immigrant against the Roma, which is a very specific ethnic mi minority, we fail a little bit no, in our analysis. So it's, if for, for instance, recently there were some statistics published on school failure among Afro-descendants, which is nearly 50%. No? So it's almost not as high as among the Roma, but far higher than among other immigrant groups, for instance. So also this idea of immigrants being more competitive, it's definitely true to some extent, but also it's, it's much more complex, really. No? There are lots of different situations. And in this study that I read the summary of recently, you could see several similarities really between the Afro descendants and, and the Roma narratives that we learned about. So, so yeah, more, more diversification. What are we talking about when we talk about immigrants? Yeah, um, well, I wanted to ask you, this was my next question, <laughs> which would be the... Um, Can yeah. take questions? Yeah. Ah, you take questions. Can I add something or make it bigger? Okay, uh, yeah, you can add, yeah. You were mentioning how um, uh, some immigrant communities have high expectations of their children regarding uh, studi studying and going further to higher education. Um, my personal uh, feeling is that, for example, in the Pakistani community, these expectations can be so high that are actually too high from my Catalan European perspective in the sense that all the family has migrated in order for the girls specifically to have better education and opportunities and so on. 
And so I would like to ask, is this personal feeling that might be completely wrong something that you are finding in these studies or not at all? I don't know if it's clear, the question. As I was saying, uh, the, uh, every community creates uh, a sort of expectation regarding their specific background on education. And it is clear that uh, literature, uh, Anglo-Saxon literature since the 90s clearly state, states that some communities, for instance, those coming from Asian countries have higher expectations to re respect uh, to education rather than others. In the case of Besos, a Escola Prim, a Escola Concepcion Anal, a Escola Duarte Marquina, this uh, specific situation is also reproduced because when you have a look at the specific uh, uh, school project, you realize that uh, there are huge difficulties with Roma population in th within these schools. These are the ones who still keep getting late to school. These are the ones who is very difficult to enroll, to engage families for participation, which creates a kind of uh, barrier with respect to communication in order to know what to do uh, on school homework or whatever. However, when you have a look at those Pakistani communities or even Chinese communities in Besos, you also realize of that. I'm not talking about from the research perspective, but from the, my former experience in, in policy making in, the, in that area. But this is reproduced in the, in the schools I'm doing research right now. And you simply see that even having a kind of uh, Roma leader, because those schools also count on a specific professional who cares on this inclusion of Roma families, students within the schools. These Roma leaders attend to school once, twice a week in order to facilitate this kind of interaction between families, uh, between both families and schools. However, this is extremely difficult and this creates uh, serious concerns with respect to what we have already learned about the importance of mentoring or modeling to promote integration because these communities already have this kind of figure of this kind of role this kind of, of professional however this does not this is not working exactly as it had been initially expected so we, we need to do more research on that in order to explore and understand why this lack of educational background on Roma communities is nearly, uh, it's extremely high to be overcome somehow. Um, are there any more questions or now? Uh, I, have a I have a question regarding the solutions part, the first one. Uh, the one with teaching, training, more flexibility from the schools and this part. Is it like a policy on a local level or an individualistic level of each school or this district, for example? Or is it a local mm. policy, supposed to be local policy for all Catalonia, for example, or specific city? Uh, okay, this uh, solution that, that I suggested, this is taken from our, the policy recommendations we, we wrote at the end of, of our project. These are, re of course, recommendations well, for, for schools to implement because right now the way the school system works, each school would decide wh what methods to implement. No? And uh, I personally think that is at least partially problematic, the fact that there is no coordination at the level of the Department of Education to, for example, ensure that at least all teachers or future teachers receive some kind of training or awareness raising within the field of diversity and migration, for example. That I think that would be desirable, but that is not the case right now. So working with the current framework that we have, this would be a recommendation, basically, for, for schools to implement at the individual school level. Hello. 
Um, so a lot of the issues you talked about, like specifically like the children showing up uh, undernourished, uh, not prepared, or how uh, these leaders, uh, Roma leaders, aren't showing the effect that you thought they might. Like a lot of it sounds like it's a wealth inequality issue as much as a diversity. And I just wonder how you isolate what is a diversity issue from what is just purely a wealth inequality issue in these schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to start or yeah. start. I, just, I can be very brief. I just say that I absolutely agree to, to a large extent it is a, a socioeconomic issue. And we have a situation where economic, socioeconomic disadvantage is racialized, right? We have an overrepresentation of situations of precariousness and lacking resources among people of Roma origin, also of migrant origin, particularly among Afro descendants, for instance, one of the most uh, well, most precarious uh, communities. So absolutely, and it's very hard to, to distinguish between what matters the most, right? But, and many of, and what we found, that, and what I think is particularly relevant when talking about the Roma, is that many of the situations explaining the low engagement in school despite ex families expressing real expectations were related to their economic, social situation and not to the fact that they were Roma but the schools would interpret that as part of Roma culture. No? That was a, a, an important misunderstanding of, of the reasons behind lacking involvement. No? In order to discuss a bit more, I would say that uh, cultural factors are really uh, relevant in those terms, because when you have a look at Roma communities that are more uh, economically uh, uh, Mm, developed somehow, you simply realize that their behavior and their attitudes towards the school mm, remain the same. And this should make us think a little bit about that. Cultural factors deeply matter in the case of Roma population. And this is clear because uh, um, this the culture for Roma population is a, is a, is a kind of, uh, 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 let's say, a shelter with respect to the symbolic aggression that sometimes the mainstream society is, has been pushing towards them for centuries. So culture is the single place, is the nest where these communities can feel safe and comfortable. And in this culture, school is not playing a prominent role. So, so cultural factors in, in the case of Roma population really matter. And in the case of migrant population, let me simply uh, say that, uh, for instance, in the, in the city of Barcelona, we have a mentoring program to, give, to provide support for uh, migrant uh, teenagers that successfully passed all this compulsory secondary education examinations and everything. However, they don't attend to university. And this is not because of economic reasons. When we started doing research on that field, we realized that there were cultural symbolic factors that were explaining why those teenagers did not attend to the university. All of them used to have the right marks and diplomas and everything. They all passed the, the, the examinations. However, there were some internal cultural attitudes that Act, acted as barriers towards their integration in higher education. This university is taking part in this program, Prometheus program, and uh, is, is a program addressed to work with cultural materials, with cultural values and others, because it is cultural factors which explain those teenagers did not attend to higher education. Now, thanks to this program, 
most of them already do the follow-up and are integrated within the university. Can I just, I'm oh sorry, <laughs> just adding that of course, I, what I meant to say was not that cultural factors are not relevant because they are, of course they are, but they are not the only factors that are relevant. And I think if, in practice, uh, Roma culture is m often mixed up with uh, uh, what we would call a cultural marginalization or a culture of being belonging to a low social class. No? And that would be a certain behaviors that were actually related more to that socioeconomic status would, from the side of the schools, be interpreted as expressions of Roma culture. And that, that is something that I think both ourselves as researchers and school staff must be very cautious of. And what I think is fundamental is for, for the schools to really work with these issues and improve inclusion is to really try to see the individual and not see a culture when they look at a Roma student, for example, or a student of a migrant origin. No, because we found also much more diversity among the families and the individual students than we expected. No, some, some identified very strongly with Roma culture, and then what Roma culture was could be a hundred different things for a for hundred different people. Also, some people did not identify very strongly with Roma culture, but maybe more with a music taste or a sports activity or something. So I think it's very simplistic to just apply the cultural lens on minorities now, and that, that's counterproductive. Yeah, but, but, yeah. <laughs> but, not, but not forget that it exists also. It's not the, <laughs> we can agree on that. I'm sure it's not the only, mm -hmm. it's not uh, the only factor. On that note, I just want to ask you uh, how much schools are doing to include the culture of the immigrants and Roma students mm -hmm. in the curriculum at least. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, so how much are um, schools doing to include the culture of the Roma or immigrant families in the curriculum? They Is there any don't. basis for that? They or? simply don't. I had the opportunity to work. I've been working with Roma population for more than 20 years uh, in Bezos or uh, in San Cosme and other neighborhoods in, in, this, in this country. And uh, my experience is that uh, this doesn't simply exist. So curriculum does not reflect the reality of Roma population. Maybe you, Zinia, have more examples and more knowledge about that. But from my practical experience, uh, the, the answer is no. We tried to do uh, a project, an action research project in San Cosme, El Prat, in order to uh, to move on a better situation in those terms. And we tried to create some uh, language materials by using uh, the Roma language uh, together with Catalan and Spanish and uh, Roma stories, Roma tales. So we kindly invited to some uh, families from the neighborhood uh, some families that ha used to have uh, children attending to the, the school and we, uh, we joined with grandmothers, mothers, fathers, uncles and, and all, all kind of uh, representatives for the community and we recorded tales and stories, Roma stories, Roma tales with all that information we uh, tried to analyze uh, a little bit the content. We tried to, uh, to type all those stories and we made a kind of, we, we reached it to, into a kind of agreement with the, the speakers and the participants in the group in order to uh, agree with the content of the tales and the stories. We also asked the, the children to make uh, drawings and pictures to illustrate the, the content of these tales and stories. And from that moment on, we edited in a proper version. And from that moment on, uh, uh, that material is the one that, that the school is using for literacy, for the learning to read and write and, and all that importance. And mm, this is the only, the, the single experience I know in, in Catalonia that uh, was intended to create a specific material coming from the Roma community 
through a participatory um, process and being used for teaching purposes. Yes, uh, one example from our, our project is, is, is very similar. That's a very good example, I think. And then in one of the schools where we worked, they were just, well, in parallel with the implementation of our project, they started to remodel the library of the school to in and included also Roma stories and Roma authors in the library. And that was very much appreciated by, by the students. No? They, they were even surprised. No? So, wow, we can, we can go to the library and we can pick a book about our culture and our stories. No? That was big for them. So, and I think that could also ideally be implemented even in schools where there are no Roma students, right? Where also mainstream majority students would learn more about Roma culture, which is part of uh, really of Spanish and Catalan culture, right? But these are still um, not any standardized practices in schools. It, it's just dependent on the school yeah. to implement it or a specific project. Yeah, I think I'm sure that Miguel, you have a more a better overview of the whole school system than I have. But, but the impression I have from these two projects that I've been working with is that it is very much dependent on each individual school, on the individual director, even who may be very engaged in these issues or not. No? Mm -hmm. so. There is a specific policy um, mm -hmm. uh, for the Roma community. Mm -hmm. However, it is true that this policy that initially in the 80s used to be what was called uh, the compensatory education programs, because when we, you have a look at the policies 20, 30 years ago with respect to Roma population, those policies were specifically addressed to compensate the lack, the, the deficit of this, because that was the approach. When uh, from the 90s on, we start to talk about inclusion rather than integration and compensatory policies, then we start to create uh, programs from that inclusive perspective. But uh, honestly, uh, those programs have not been exhaustively uh, uh, analyzed, mm, specifically, specifically uh, with respect to the impact. And uh, those programs deeply depend on the um, attitude of the school staff and, uh, and the people. However, I have to say that all the schools that are working with Roma population, no matter, no matter if it is in metropolitan area of Barcelona or Fond de la Polvora in uh, Girona or Torreforta in Tarragona, all those schools that are rooted within communities with a strong Roma identity, they all are kindly invited to work in that perspective. So it is more than a policy, a need. And the, the, the school staff is extremely conscious of that. Of that. I, I can add in addition to that, which I think was important, an important finding in our project was that the students of Roma origin who experienced the direct situations of racism and discrimination in the schools were in all cases students who went, who, whose parents tended to have actually higher educational ambitions and they, they placed their children in semi-private schools or in schools that had a very good reputation with a majority of white major, uh, Catalan students. And there they experienced much racism, not so much from the school staff, which also happened, but mainly from the other families. Now understand the, the feeling that other children were not allowed to play with them, their parents said don't, inter don't interact with the Roma kids, that's a problem, and, and so on. So, the, the, as Miguel says, the level of inclusion and awareness and work methods that are positive for these students were, were generalized in the schools where the high rate of Roma students. But in the schools where the Roma students were a small minority, we found very different situations. Now, and those were the, the children who had difficulties with, with exclusion and some even uh, ended up leaving school because of that. So the idea that that would improve their opportunities actually paradoxically turned out to be the other way around no? because of the non-inclusion that they experienced. Um, so hmm. would, would you say that um, Roma or immigrant children that would be discriminated um, would prefer to be in schools with high levels of diversity from your projects? I would guess so, yes. yes. Mm. Mm. Social reality is yeah. a fact. So mm. children attend to the school it is placed in their neighborhood. 
So if a neighborhood has an increasing number of people with those uh, features, it is the school that has to reflect that kind of reality. Yeah. That's also a problem that's related to the segregation, right? If you would imagine an ideal scenario where you would take all the pupils of Barcelona in a bowl and throw them out in equal numbers across the schools with maybe 10, 15% of immigrant and Roma students in all schools, maybe that would be the ideal scenario, no? And then we wouldn't have the situation, but, but it's quite utopic. But they are changing, they are making changes right now at the level of the Department of Education, also in the admission systems. And I think it's important to talk about that too when we talk about diversity in schools, no? the, how the admission works. They used to, for example, be a system where you get points for different criteria. And one of those criteria was to be an, a former student of the same school. And that would, of course, be detrimental for the opportunities of newcomers no, to enter the schools if people are given priority based on having been themselves students of that school. No? So they take their children to the same school and they enter before the newcomers in the more popular school. And that is something that has just been abolished. So that's one way to try to, by some micro measures, you know, to, to combat segregation. Um, and I wanted to ask you, since you mentioned about inclusive education, so what would you consider are the basis for an inclusive education? Mm -hmm. Well, to, to reply to that question, I, I brought some, some slides. Because uh, one of the hypotheses to think about this issue of inclusion, of inclusive society uh, and inclusive schools, school system, has a direct relationship to an evidence that we find out when you have a look at the uh, situation of, of the educational systems. Society is new, but educational systems tend to remain the same. So inclusion will be an opportunity and not a problem, a challenge and not a problem, when we try to move from the former educational systems into new frameworks where inclusion can be an opportunity. And this uh, responds to three big policies. The first one, that schools realize that education is not only a concern for themselves, but also for the whole community. The more you push the schools to open up their doors and welcome people from the community to participate into a democratic, let's say, uh, governance, the better the inclusive uh, ethos will be possible to set up. And this seriously implies some, so, some issues on, on that. Uh, the relationship between the school and the community has a strong link, and uh, we sh should try to implement educational projects closely related to communities. Uh, we realize that when, you, when we talk about school communities, uh, those school communities are very inclusive and regarding the cultural diversity and other types of diversity from an intersectional perspective are better uh, included somehow. No? The second one is to move from the notion, from the idea that the school is a whole system to understand that the, the system is created within the community. And this is also very important <coughs> because one single school cannot have all the resources that may need to cover the needs, to supply all the issues, all the proposals that are needed to create, to build up an inclusive education. So the more the schools are working in a network, 
together to one to each other. The more the schools integrate into a specific system closely related to the neighborhood and the community, the better the schools will be able to do so. So we need to shift into a systemic strategy with some ideas to overcome the one single rule or to overcome the special needs that migrants or Roma uh, we think they have and to create this kind of opportunities in terms of diversity. And the third one is to move from integration to inclusion. This is a very important topic for, the, for, an, education, uh, for an educational framework because uh, inclusion tries to understand that all of us need some attention. All of us have special needs, not only some of the students or some of the participants. That is why to move into an inclusive atmosphere creates this framework where uh, these traditional methods are uh, basically uh, apart and we introduce those methods that facilitate that all the students may find their own place within the school. And could you give any example of uh, what you mean, uh, more relation with the community? Um, just w what, are, what, what is, does this mean in practice? Does that mean more relation with the entities in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. community services? Yes, uh, we may consider that the school is a place where lessons are given, or the school is a cultural and social meeting place for the whole community, where obviously in the morning you have lessons, lessons closely related through uh, some methodologies, uh, project methodologies with the community, but maybe in the afternoon, in the evening, there are some other cultural activities concerning music, arts, uh, sports, and this is the school as well as a whole ethos that is working together and the activity in the morning, the activity in the afternoon, the activity in the evening creates a kind of a whole experience for the children and the youngsters of the community. This is uh, a reality in some of our neighborhoods. Uh, I, I may give some concrete examples if you, if you like in some neighborhoods, but the, the, the whole idea is to create that global approach on education, where the school has a, plays a prominent role, but it is also complemented with other educational activities in the field of culture, in the field of arts, in other fields that make the school uh, a locus of uh, culture, culture and creation and, and community development somehow. And uh, um, is this only oriented to children who are migrants? As far as I know, no, this is uh, for okay. Because, uh, well, from my experience, from my research in Raval, all of these activities were um, concentrated, uh, they were directed towards immigrant children or Roma children, and that further, uh, that was segregating further uh, them from in the other students. In the case of uh, this notion, of uh, uh, community education is for the whole community, not only for those who are migrants or Roma with, with a Roman background. Roma background. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, just a little technical detail. When uh, I hear you, you speak about inclusive education. Um, when I've checked this, uh, some literature regarding this, at least in the Catalan context, I have the feeling I might be wrong that uh, this concept is used more for uh, students with uh, disabilities, with functional um, diversity. So for instance, the school I used to go to, I, 
I was surprised that they define themselves, they label themselves as an inclusive school, but I feel like they might be absolutely not a single uh, migrant student. And on the other hand, I did find a lot of literature talking about intercultural education. I wonder if we're talking about the same thing or... Uh, s uh, the notion of inclusion, uh, we, we must look at the, the, the background in the notions and the ideas that the Warnock Report in 81 and Mel Enskom for UNESCO used to, pro to, to produce during the 80s. That notion of inclusion, which is mm, mainly educational, this is an educational approach, tends to overcome the notion of integration. Because integration is mainly devoted to those children that have a kind of disability. When we talk about inclusion, we open up this conception and try to include and understand that actually we all have special needs somehow. This is reconfirmed by the Conferencia de Salamanca in 2004 by UNESCO and the International Conference of Education in Geneva 2008. Both conferences state that inclusion is a model for diversity management for all, not only for those with disabilities. And this is reconfirmed by the international programs such as the Big Strategy Education 2020 or the uh, Global Development Goals, the, the current uh, Global Development Goals, the, the goal number four is address to education. If you have a look at it, you will realize that the notion and the narrative on inclusion is not addressed to those with disabilities, but for all, in terms of a global conception of understanding a radical diversity, including not only disabilities, but also cultural issues, gender issues, religious issues, linguistic issues, sexual orientation issues, everything. So intercultural education would be a specific topic on this notion of inclusion and diversity. So when you talk about inclusion, that it covers all type of diversities, for example, one that I consider that it would be quite easy to cover and it's not always covered is the socioeconomical uh, because there are many countries, many welfare state, define themselves welfare state countries that have help for all the children under 18 that they all have the same opportunities. And I have the feeling that here in Catalonia or in Spain, we don't really target that because if you're um, explaining that there are cases of undernourished children or not well dressed, what about that from a policy perspective? I mean, how to address the situation? How to give aid or help or... Yes, as you say, of course, there is a, a policy or a political issue. It's about political decisions and political will and the dis distribution policies, no? But I also think that we have to dare to talk about structural inequalities in the education system here in Catalonia. As in the rest of Spain, we have a strongly structurally unequal system with a strong division, for example, between public and private schools, which also contributes to this ethnic and socioeconomic segregation that we see as a result. And that has detrimental effects for the opportunities of many of these children, right? So I think if we don't talk about it also from that angle, we miss, we miss part of the, the root causes no, for this situation of school failure. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it is years that uh, evidence-based research by OECD, for instance, the state that we need to move uh, from uh, an equality paradigm into an equity paradigm. There are uh, very remarkable 
uh, uh, literature by OECD, which simply states that uh, which are the specific measures that educational systems must implement in order to uh, move into an equity uh, framework. And I think this is a, a good way to, to understand how we may overcome that socioeconomic gap that some families suffer from. And this uh, is basically one of the, the major challenges. Let me recommend you one report which has been recently published by Intermon Oxfam. The author is Xavier Bonal. It is titled uh, Equidad y Educación en España. Extremely simple. <laughs> and it is a kind of uh, literature review uh, based on evidences, as I was saying. And 10 topics are focused there in order to understand which are the, the main uh, elements we need to be aware in order to create a more equitable system in Spain, for instance. It has been published one month ago, and it is uh, very reachable on the, on the web. Thank you very much first. Um, well, you mentioned about uh, how mainstream cultures might oppress minorities, um, but also mainstream education might also undermine some groups, right? Um, and that leads to the question how we define education and who takes the role of education and which tools we choose to employ in the educational uh, settings. Um, and with that said, I want to please that you develop a little bit more how um, have you incorporated, how have you experienced more alternative um, educational means, educational tools in the, in the past uh, decades here in Catalonia. Um, and that is sad because uh, if we define success as attending university or uh, having good grades, uh, some people have already failed, even before started. Uh, but as we know, some Roman communities have um, highlighted more of um, artistic or, mil uh, or less conventional uh, areas. And how do we create them more opportunities and uh, foster more um, yeah, programs and projects related to what they know best uh, back home. Yeah. And I do have a question to you as well, uh, Zeni. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Zeni. Um, oh, you are Miko and you are Zeni. I? I, I think I'm confusing <laughs> the names. Zeni. Zeni, Zeni. yeah. Um, well, in the education, uh, in the Swedish education system, people have designed policy more specific to minority groups as well, including um, language classes to minority mm. uh, populations, Romans included. So I want to know how you, as a Swedish person, uh, see yourself researching in the Catalan uh, context. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can take one more question here, or a few. Um, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask about the uh, school and community uh, pairing, like uh, increasing in proximity as a new framework. I wanted to ask, so I don't know much about the context here, but I, from what I understand, there's a difference between public and private schools. Um, so like in considering that difference, and uh, I'm assuming that the uh, communities of private schools would be richer themselves, while free, not paid schools would have poorer communities, I wonder if this pairing and uh, this collaboration would maybe even deepen, possibly, the, uh, this discrepancy. And uh, secondly, also, I wanted to ask, um, Rita, as Professor Zenia's uh, research kind of showed, the uh, um, 
Roma kids who went to um, paid schools were discriminated more as the parents themselves were encouraging their kids to um, act in a more racist manner against them. So um, again, I, I assume with the community and school getting uh, closer and working together, I wonder if the families themselves will be, would be included, wouldn't this be a, um, a potential arena for further tension as families are there and like, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I thought like it might, I don't know, I would like mm. to hear what you think about it. Uh, thank you. Um, is there any other question? Okay. <laughs> thank you. Just to thank you for the fruitful uh, debate. I think it's very interesting and opportunity to speak about education that is not in the master. And then I think it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good way huh, for, for all of us to, to have this, uh, this topic. In any case, the, the, the mapping that you have done is very interesting, um, but uh, I have maybe one, one conceptual concern also. Uh, it's about um, the concept of failure, because it's one of them. Uh, wh wh what does exactly mm. means when you speak about uh, uh, failure, which mm. is very important in, in most of the data, because, and I see that there are not a consensus about uh, what, what does uh, Failure means uh, uh, mm. because of, okay, failure may means that uh, a child has no opportunity to go to the university. Then maybe this is a failure, or a failure may means that uh, they, they don't reach the level and that they the, they, they must abandon the uh, aft, after after the compulsory school. They must abandon the school system. Uh, they don't go. Uh, they go, and but failure may may also means. And then I think this could be uh, interesting to explore, uh, at least uh, uh, from my ignorance, because I'm not from my education, of course. Um, but uh, the idea that uh, uh, the starting point, and then uh, we reach the idea of equity there, I think so, the starting point of, of, of this kind of child that come from migration background, uh, uh, that come uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Roma and so on, uh, they, they don't, they don't enter in the education system with the same tools, with the same uh, opportunities. The starting point is, and then failure means, in this case, that uh, the, the school system don't, uh, don't uh, um, manage uh, uh, to solve the potentiality of exclusion. Mm -hmm. They don't, uh, and then from this point of view, failure, I think it uh, uh, could be a, a very interesting concept because uh, the idea is that uh, uh, the, for one reason or another, the reason that you are taking now, but uh, the school system, uh, for one way or another, uh, does not manage uh, to uh, solve the, the potentiality of exclusion and then people uh, that go from, from this kind of uh, profile uh, uh, still uh, have uh, exclusion in the background and when they abandon the school and so on. And then I think that the idea of inclusion and exclusion is very important in, in the definition of failure. But I just wonder uh, which kind of a definition you have uh, of failure, which I think is not a consensus. Huh? Uh, and then the way we define failure may also uh, be important in the way we are dealing with this debate. And another one, just for maybe for Zenia, because I know that uh, she's working on that, but I think uh, uh, in, in at the level of solutions, or I believe the level of, of uh, the, the idea of the curriculum is very important. Uh, the idea that colonialism is not in the, in, and, uh, mm. and um, now that I am myself working on colonialism and post-colonial studies and so on, uh, there is a trend that say that most of the racism and most of the discrimination existing in all societies are, to, are very linked to colonialists because uh, we are racist with, because the whole history uh, has criminalized uh, determinated culture. Uh, here, Morocco culture, and then racism belongs to our history because uh, the expulsion of, uh, of a Muslim mm -hmm. uh, 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 is related mm -hmm. to that. Eh? And then from this point of view, the idea that to incorporate in the co in curriculum uh, this kind of thing that completely disappear with with intentions uh, from the curriculum is very important. And another one is the representativity. I would like myself, I always say, I would like myself that my, 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 my daughter uh, have a Morocco uh, professor of mathematics. I would like to. Uh, 
uh, to mm. have this kind of representativity. And at this level, the representativity in Spain is very low. And then uh, that's, that's play a, a negative effect on the failure uh, that we are speaking because uh, mm. most of the, the most of the professors are white uh, uh, and, 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 and does not represent uh, the, uh, the, the, the diversity that already exists. Uh, and the fact that uh, somebody has a professor that is from Morocco background, Chinese background, Filipinos or whatever, or, or, or Roma uh, background, I, I am fully convinced that may help to reduce uh, this kind of failure. Huh? Mm. But just to know your opinion about that. Mm -hmm. About failure, well, do you want to start? Thanks, yeah. thanks for <laughs> such a, uh, an interesting discussion mm -hmm. on, on those topics. Uh, to start first with the colleague who was interested on uh, that uh, issue of education and those missing uh, areas of culture and, and others. L let me first say that uh, from that community education perspective, uh, education goes beyond schooling. And this is closely linked to the issue of uh, equity that we were already mentioning. Because nowadays, the big challenge is not only inside the school. Maybe 50 years ago, half a century ago, the big challenge was that all the children had to go to school. But nowadays, well, there are 70 million children who don't attend at school in the world. And this is not uh, as a, a little number. Hmm? This is 70 million is a lot. And we need to move and work more and more to, to, to overcome this big problem. However, most of the population attend to school. This is not the problem. The problem is that uh, despite all of them attend to school, some of them keep being successful with lots of resources and others, and others stay apart. And that is why this idea that education goes beyond schooling tries to introduce some alternative issues that are important for our society today in terms of uh, culture, humanities, and others that make the, di make the difference when dealing and providing opportunities for equality. And that, that is why we, we need to move on that perspective. Uh, concerning public and, and private, let me say that within private schools, there is uh, also uh, a remarkable diversity of them. So there are uh, private schools with uh, uh, an exclusive interest of competition and being the first ones. Those schools are normally reluctant towards culture or other notions of community education. However, you realize you, you, you may find private, some private schools that are seriously providing opportunities for equality. For, for, for they are fighting for the right to education of all the children in deprived areas, economically deprived areas. And you also find public schools in some well-off areas where this notion of community or uh, society and values and others are missing. So the ownership of the, of the establishment, let's say so, uh, is not as uh, remarkable as in other times. So uh, it is obvious that public schools must provide a public service and they must be open to all. They mustn't um, discriminate anyone because it is an imperative according to their nature. However, uh, it is not as clear as in other previous uh, periods because both public and private are in a process of transformation where the notion of governance creates a new framework where both public and private stakeholders work together hand 
in hand to push the educational system uh, for success. Let me remind uh, the, report, the UNESCO report in 2015 uh, titled Rethinking Education. It's very short. If you are interested in the issue, I would kindly suggest to read it. Uh, it is also reachable on the, on the web. And this PDF shows that the cooperation between both private and public sector is the key for success within the educational system. And they develop this kind of rational and try to provide background uh, and, and so on. So I, I would go in that way. And concerning the two questions by, by Ricard, uh, I think that in recent literature, more than talking about failure, uh, it is said underachievement concerning standards. Because uh, if we think that uh, it, it is not a kind of failure, but it is an achievement which is not necessary enough to become well integrated in society. So the notion of underachievement, I think it is in recent literature, the one which is becoming more and more well accepted. And uh, concerning the curriculum and this post-colonialism work that we all have to do, you simply reminded me uh, so, uh, Sosa Santos and, and the notion of the, the importance of the absences more than the presences. So maybe uh, we, we need to, to focus also our attention on, uh, on the absences uh, rather than the presences and maybe in this way we'll be, we'll be able to introduce <coughs> within the curriculum because it is not a matter of criticizing the current curriculum. This uh, is not right or whatever, but uh, it is much better to understand and analyze what is really missing. And from that perspective, to increase the value of cultural diversity somehow. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would like, before I answer your question about the Swedish uh, compared to the Catalan school system, very interesting question, thank you for that. I would just like to add a comment on the division between public and private schools for those of you who are not familiar with the Catalan school system. When we talk about private schools here, we talk about the semi-private schools generally, the concertadas, which are partially publicly funded and uh, which, for instance, in some more socioeconomically marginalized neighborhoods, for instance, may offer free education thanks to scholarships. So it's not necessarily elite schools that we're talking about. But still, I think, uh, to adding to what Miguel said, I think it's relevant to distinguish here between the content, how diversity, for example, is addressed in the content in the curriculum of the school and the question of access, what families can access certain schools still it's a fact that in, in the cases of most the concertados, semi-private schools, you will have to be able to pay a fee of around 400 euros per month, or otherwise, you can, if you're not eligible for a scholarship, you cannot have your child in that school, and that's a very concrete segregational mechanism. It's hard to, to get around that. And it's the same in public schools, which are supposed to be free of charge. What we found in uh, our Roma study, for instance, was that still the economic, the costs of the school actually was the segregational mechanism and that also influenced on the teacher's perception on certain families as problematic. For instance, the families, generally Roma families, who were not able to pay for excursions so the child would be left alone in class while the rest of the class went to a water park, for instance, you know, with all the emotional consequences for the child and for the family who felt publicly shamed. In other cases, the, the families who could not pay for costs for school material, they were not given that material so that everybody would go out with their books except those children who, whose parents could not pay for the books, for instance, and the, the others would sometimes humiliate them. And so, so those were very uncomfortable situations that were completely related to a kind of economic segregation in the schools, right? Also in public schools. So for me, that is actually the most striking and most shocking thing coming from the Swedish system where everything is completely free of charge, where there are no, no public, or there are no private schools. There are free schools that are run privately, but completely funded by, by the public system. So 
So that is one thing that is shocking for me because it's a kind of very segment, cemented inequality you know, that is often not questioned here because it's very much taken for granted. And I noticed that when I discussed this with different actors. Even very progressive people tend to not question the fact that we have almost 50% of students in private schools with the segregation that that implies. No? So uh, that is one thing. The other thing about the multicultural education is true that Sweden is known for its uh, emphasis on the home language education, the right to home language education in schools. There are no clear results on whether this has been positive or negative for the learning or the results of, of minority students. And I think personally that when the Swedish school system nowadays is not an example of success, it has rates of, of uh, underachievement or school failure, if you want to use that term, similar to the Spanish case. And I think that's more related actually to the very strong uh, geographical segregation rather than the way schools function. So I think that in that case, the, the other demographic and socioeconomic circumstances and the ethnic segregation are more influential than actually how they work in the school curriculum. So, uh, here in Catalonia, they are just now implementing a new program called Plurilinguisme that is uh, a way to implement home language education in the school curriculum during regular school hours and also to encourage majority ethnic students, of Catalan students, to learn languages as Arabic or Chinese, for example, during school hours. And I think it would be interesting to see the results of that. I think it's a positive uh, attempt to uh, diversify the schools, so to speak. No? So, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, about f the term failure, the fact that uh, I use the term failure in my work, it's because it's the term used in uh, statistics, in policies, etc. And there is a very concrete, very clear definition. School failure is here defined as not finishing ESO, not finishing secondary education at age 16 with uh, an approved result. No. People who do not graduate from compulsory school are considered to have failed in the school system. And that is a very early level of failure actually when you're 16 for m these students we saw the numbers 64 percent of roma students around 30 percent of immigrant students do not achieve to to finish compulsory school which means that they cannot continue to secondary or less so tertiary education so if we want more representation of diversity in schools which i personally believe i totally agree with ricard it's completely fundamental that we have moroccan pakistanian uh, African origin teachers in, in the schools also to make minority families identify with schools, to encourage minority students to continue and, and to see that they can also become teachers, etc. But in order to achieve that, we need to combat the school failure and, and achieve more <laughs> students of minority origins at the universities to become teachers. No, that's, I was very happy with it. after this Roma project, one of the Ro young Roma women we worked with actually started to study to become a teacher at the Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. That's one example, but still, as, as you said in the beginning, these are individual exceptional cases. No? And for that to become something normalized, there is still a long way to go. And I think that in order to get there, one of the things we have to address is this also this socioeconomic segregation that I mentioned. And uh, finally, the curriculum, of course, it's very central. The content of, of uh, what, we, what are taught in schools, actually, how do we understand history and the role of other, other cultures, other continents, migration, etc. No? And I think it's important there that this is not only a question to be treated in schools with high levels of diversity, but that it should be completely normalized so also in schools in areas where there may not be any or, or almost no students uh, of migrant origin, uh, it would still be normalized in, in the curriculum. Let's talk about colonization, slavery, Roma history, etc. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, um, I think before, no, uh, there was education for citizenship in the Catalan curriculum. Is this still on? No, not anymore since 2019. Of course, sorry, 13, I, was, uh, I wanted to say, because uh, citizenship education uh, used to be uh, in the curriculum uh, from 2006 until 2013 with the Education Act, La Ley de Educación. Uh, but after 2013, with the new, with the uh, 
new education act uh, it dis simply disappeared because of an uh, ideological uh, issue. Uh, citizenship education used to teach uh, this, this subject wanted the students to learn that equality was uh, an important value for living together uh, in the field of culture, but also in the field of gender, in the field of sexual orientation, in the field of uh, disabilities, in the field of discrimination to any kind of uh, social issues. And uh, the political majority at that moment uh, considered that this was a kind of ideological instruction inside the schools and they tried to take it out. Mm -hmm. uh, I figure that uh, in this current curriculum uh, reform that we are living now in, in Spain, thanks to the shift in, in the Spanish government with a new kind of uh, correlation forces uh, in, in the field of policy, in, in politics, we'll find, we, we, re, we reconsider this decision and we'll try to introduce a kind of citizenship education. Maybe it will not be uh, told this way because this would simply remind some former uh, curricular approaches that might create uh, a real problem <laughs> in terms of uh, discussion and argu an argument uh, within society. Uh, probably it will be taught uh, ethics, education or others, but the importance that the school must play an important role to build up uh, values and educate in values through the students is, uh, is a consensus nowadays. And I figure that this will be a reality from, from very soon on. Do you want to say something about this, or uh, do we take more questions? Maybe the last yes, ones, maybe very, only? Very final comment, just in, in relation to this. We talk about schools, and we talk about minority families a lot, now, but we don't talk about much about the mainstream and majority families, and I think that is very important, especially when we saw that the cases of discrimination, for example, in the Roma project, were mainly cases of majority families not accepting the diversity you know, of the school where their, their children were. And uh, th that is something I think that we need to include in this debate to a greater extent, you know, and, and yeah, and address. Mm. And uh, to what extent do you think um, schools are promoting uh, more intercultural relations between different ethnic groups, immigrants and Roma, uh, or, or between families? The, mm. Or they're just directing their policies towards Roma or towards immigrant families? Just over one. Again, that, that depends very much on the character of the school because what we found when we talked to the families and we talked to school directors and both uh, teachers and directors who wanted to participate in the project and those who were not willing to, and the, some of the conversations were also off the record, and altogether the, the picture that we got was that in the schools with high levels of, of diversity, of high, high degrees of immigrant students and Roma students, uh, everybody from the majority culture who would take their kids there, they know where they are going, right? And they are also, of course, informed about that by the teachers and by the staff, and you know that this is a diverse school and you know that, and you don't have a problem with that, right? And, but in the, in the other schools where um, diversity is still uh, exceptional, we found more examples for, of, of, of directors who would, for example, consider it maybe it's something that they don't want to highlight or that they would say, say to majority families, Perhaps this is the perception based on interviews with minority families, right? Mm -hmm. But they had the feeling that school staff are siding with the majority families against them, that they felt that they are like, okay, so we, we are sorry, we have these uh, Roma students here, but we cannot do much about it, no? But it, a little bit, that, that feeling was transmitted to us. No? And what would you family be the ways uh, for schools to solve these problems between uh, the families? L let me say that family uh, participation, family engagement, maybe it is better. Uh, family engagement, family involvement is a recent issue in our country. I mean, re recent issue, only two, three decades uh, of importance. So the current parents, when they bring their children to schools, 
they did not live in participatory uh, schools somehow. They have no background on a notion of school that is open to the community and where families may take part. Uh, when you have a look at uh, the difficulties that migrant families uh, tend to have when participating uh, at schools, language is one of the major barriers because uh, not all the, the people uh, when they arrive uh, in the country are uh, well, uh, well, are fluent or they, are, they have uh, a proficiency in the school language, and then they, they feel this is a barrier to get involved in the, in the school. However, there are some experiences and some good practices that we, we may identify where we realize that some parents uh, with a migrant background that uh, have been staying in the country for more years tend to um, have this kind of role of translators not mediators or mentors, translators. And thanks to this translation, they often uh, have more opportunities, more chances for participating and getting involved in the, in the school of their children. Sometimes in the case of secondary educations, it is the children themselves who act as translators for, those, for their parents. <laughs> and it is a kind of special, uh, a nourishment for those children because they already got the language, the school language, and they become useful for their parents in order to facilitate communication with staff, teachers, or what, whatsoever. In the case of Roma, language is not an issue, mainly an issue, when we, in terms of uh, not, in terms of Basil Bernstein, it is a big issue but not in terms of uh, general uh, language education in, in Spanish, for instance. But uh, the barriers are more uh, in terms of, uh, as I was saying before, of expectation and also concerning the, the needs and the, the benefits that this participation may bring to those families. Uh, Roma communities are very practical and they always try to uh, culturally uh, reflect and understand what, uh, if what they are going to do is, is useful or not. What is the sense? We all do that for sure. But in the case of uh, Roma communities, when they receive proposals from the school, the first question is why? What is the sense? Uh, what is the, the aim that you pursue? when you do this proposal. So uh, if you create uh, sensible proposals for Roma families, they participate. If, they just, if you just say uh, you have to come to this uh, meeting with parents to talk about the curriculum and the curricular goals for your children this year, well, this, is, this makes no sense. This doesn't make sense for myself either. <laughs> In, in, when I have to attend to my, the meet, my, my parents' meetings for, for my children, uh, it's very difficult to me to understand what is the real meaning of going there and listening to multiplication, division, the frog, uh, the, the geography and others. But uh, maybe because of my cultural background, I may, I may support these kind of meetings. In the case of Roma population, they are extremely practical. Uh, the, the common sense is something that is extremely rooted in their way of understanding and, and dealing with. And that is why sometimes we need to create real meaningful approaches to make, to facilitate those families come to the school. If you go on traditional proposals concerning curriculum, uh, evaluation, assessment, or others, it, it's not at, uh, appealing for them, somehow. And do you think the communication strategies are working with these families? Are the they fa failing the to communicate the well? Issue, the big issue is that sometimes there's a big confusion within schools between information and communication. The schools normally inform. They provide mm -hmm. sheets with information, 
within the school bags of the children. They sometimes send you a WhatsApp messenger message by saying tomorrow there is uh, an excursion here or there. You have to bring this or that. This is information, but not communication. Communication requires time. And this is what is sometimes missing at schools because sometimes teachers don't have enough time to communicate with families. Sometimes they don't want, but sometimes they do, but they don't have the enough spaces to real, to, to real communication, to really communicate with families. Communication in terms of a dialogic discourse with families, building up together a common sense of schooling and trying to respect and understanding what they expect from the school and trying to integrate those issues within the school project, the educational project. Mm -hmm. oh. and, and in that framework, perhaps to a greater extent, be flexible and be willing to change or try other methods as well, because there is an attitude often in the schools, and I think that is mainly because of pressure, lack of time, because of routine, because this is the way we have always done it, but to transmit to the students that, and their families that this is the way we do it here, like it or not. No? And I noticed that a lot with uh, my own children's school as well, as a, as a foreigner who may not be completely always agreeing with all the, all the ways we do it here. No? But there is very little tolerance for questioning and the critique is not very well taken. So that is something that we could transmit to the schools. I think that, yeah, more egalitarian dialogue and willingness to try new, new ways of doing things. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can, yeah take the last couple mm -hmm. of questions. There's five minutes. Um, hi, so I have a question for Mikkel. Um, I, you were talking a little bit about like the practicality issue um, and you said that it's sort of rooted in Roma culture. And I guess my question is, do you think that culture is the source of the like need to be practical or more socioeconomic problems that are structural and a part of everyday life for Roma communities? So like things like access to resources like time, knowledge, or like previous school experience that could inform a parent on as to why it's important to attend a meeting like that. Uh -huh. And we do the, another question. <laughs> I was wondering anyone who would like to answer about the importance of the role of non-formal education in the sense of cows and splice, so that's a kind of a, um, this, yeah, uh, which is very popular in Catalonia, um, and I think uh, can be very powerful in intercultural education or the different topics we've been talking about, um, especially in cows from Bezos or many other neighborhoods with uh, high, numbers of immigration. And also in this um, group, I would include um, monitors, um, counselors that work in the playground of schools. So outside of the formal classes, um, even during lunchtime, this kind of when parents come and leave to the kids and so on. I have some friends working in, this, in schools in these um, um, roles. And I think these are very important moments of the day in school that are sometimes not appreciated. Okay. And last question, was it you as well, or no? There was no hands. No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, mm, I'm Marxist from the 80s, since the 80s. So I would never neglect socioeconomic factors that is probably why the, the reason why I seriously think that we need to consider some other factors in order to, more, to go to more complex explainings that if, uh, if you don't do that, you won't be able to understand the real complexity. So all the factors are remarkable, all the factors are relevant. I never denied in my discourse that socioeconomic factors are not remarkable. But that is the reason why, precisely, I need to put the focus on social and cultural factors because they are 
illuminating, they are highlighting some uh, factors, some dynamics that in other terms would not be understandable. So in terms of understanding why uh, Roma population becomes more practical, I think that it is due to more social and cultural factors rather than socio-economic factors. And I would be willing to, to be in another debate on that issues if you like. I'm really in the mood to do it uh, another day and to go deeper into that question if you, if you like, to understand better the reasons from one side or another or another and to explain more those factors. But I think seriously, I th seriously think that saying that everything matters is not a good answer in research. So you have to go and get committed to your data and say this is probably more remarkable than that or that that one and you need to create a kind of explanation where all the factors maybe explain some issues and some of the factors explain others and it doesn't happen anything on that. And concerning non-formal education, I absolutely agree with you. It's essential from the perspective of inclusion and intercultural education. And you also mentioned a thing which is really important and becomes invisible in our country. More than 40% of the timing that a primary school student spends inside the school is outside the classroom. You understand? So the importance of those places, of those, uh, let's say, uh, free time activities, the importance of the uh, break at lunch, during the lunch time, the extracurricular activities after uh, the school in the afternoon and others is uh, really uh, very remarkable and we need to, uh, to focus on, on that non-formal education as a source of opportunities to build up inclusion together, closing to, to close together with the schools. Yeah, addressing your question, specific question about cow and uh, the extracurricular activities. Uh, of course, there is, again, one economic dimension, which is the fact that these, many of these activities have high costs. For example, the football, well, sports classes, etc. No? We know that many minority students cannot engage in these activities because of the cost. But there is clearly also a cultural dimension. In, for instance, the cow. Cow is in itself not expensive. Uh, but when you go to the cow, it, you get a sense that this is a very monocultural Catalan environment. I have had my own children in a cow when I've been very engaged in that and other extracurricular activities. And I know the feeling that you, you don't know exactly what's going on, but you're very different from the rest, right? And you don't feel perhaps included. Maybe there is a special event outside of the activities, a dinner at somebody's house, and you're not invited. These kind of experiences, I think, are more likely to happen if you come from a minority group, even if you're a Swedish immigrant, right? So, so I think that, well, I, I understand the feeling that many minority students and their families have, that they are more at ease, they feel better in more international environments where there are people from lots of different cultures interacting together. So maybe one thing, one, one way to improve inclusion is, of course, I increasing the rate of participation in El Cao and other forms of, of activities in, in the Catalan society, but also to invent new forms, right? And new activities, new institutions, etc. cetera. Yeah. But uh, mm. inclusion for the Catalan Sorry. Oh, sorry, scouts. sorry. Cow, scouts. The scouts, the scouts. Uh, the cow yeah. is the scouts in the Catalan. Uh, uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. cow, of course, cow. Yeah, yeah, cow. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's happens when you go local, no? unfortunately. <laughs> Don't explain it. Okay. I'm so sorry. sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't make sense at all, of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
So if there are no further questions, uh, yeah, we can end. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you.